So we're very lucky today to be joined by four expert panellists from each of the main carbon tools, AgriCalc, Cool Farm Tool, Farm Carbon Calculator and Sandy. So I'll start by handing over to the first of our panellists, Julian from AgriCalc. If you want to give a quick intro to yourself and your tool, that would be great. Oh, Julia, I think you're on mute. Great start. Uh, <laughs> Glad it was Welcome, me. everyone. I hope that uh, great to be here. And thank you, Holly, for introducing us. So we would like to uh, here today give a quick introduction to AgriCalc for those that are not familiar with, with AgriCalc. So I'm Julian Bell. I'm the Director of Agriculture for AgriCalc. And AgriCalc is all about resource efficient farming, helping farmers farm sustainably. Just some of the key aspects of AgriCalc that we hope would you'll find useful or helpful, depending on your um, sector uh, that you're in. So we've got a big focus on resource use efficiency. So AgriCalc was developed over 17 years ago now to help farmers be productive uh, and reduce their carbon emissions. So it's developed by farm advisors uh, with the backup of research, world leading research at SREC. And we're now a, an independent company uh, connected to SREC uh, to deliver uh, effective carbon calculators for the industry. The, the core element of AgriCalc is that it's based on the whole farm and then breaking down into the enterprises and also for all the products that the farm produces. And the key thing for us is that there are so many synergies between enterprises on the farm and AgriCal works hard to make those connections uh, and demonstrate those benefits. Farming is the original circular economy and it really operates uh, like an ecosystem. And so we're very, uh, we find that very important and some of our mixed farms we find have got some of the lowest carbon footprints. So AgriCal also includes sequestration in terms of woodlands, soils and hedges. And that's an important element to, uh, to, to round out the results. We cover all the main enterprises, beef, <laughs> lamb, dairy, pigs, poultry, and the crops, different cropping patterns. AgriCalc has been used on a wide range of projects across the country, um, Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, and we also work overseas. And we have different coefficients that can be matched to regional parameters. We are independent. We're purely focused on delivering the most accurate science to the user. Uh, as a user, some of the benefits of AgriCalc are We've got over 12,000 farms in our database. They are, uh, the reports are validated, checked by an experienced agricultural consultant. And that means we have the best data we can in, in the database. And that provides very valuable feedback, sector by sector, enterprise by enterprise, in a lot of detail in terms of carbon emissions, where are the hotspots, and also related to that, all the physical parameters of the farm. Uh, performance of that enterprise. AgriCalc is simple, simple design, easy to use, uh, and it's it's got a lot of features uh, that are practical and can help the farmer or those advisors helping them to understand what, what's happening in the, in the system, wh where the missions are coming from, and areas for improvement. We've got a long future roadmap development and improvement. We've just released AgriCalc Cloud, uh, and that's APIs as well for, for web interconnection. And we're very focused on continuing to help farmers produce food sustainably. And of course, we can be contacted if you have questions or inquiries. Uh, and that's our contact details there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julian. Um, so I will now pass over to Richard from Cool Farm Tool. And I would just get your slides, Richard. So I've got, I've got them here. Oh, you've got them. Perfect. Yeah. I'm assuming it's sharing. 
Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I'm Richard Profit. I'm the Chief Executive of the Cool Farm Alliance. We're a science-led, not-for-profit membership organisation that owns and manages the Cool Farm tool uh, to support farm decision-making to advance regenerative agriculture at scale. Um, the scope of the Cool Farm tool, so we've got a variety of things. So this has evolved and built over 15 years that the Cool Farm tool has been in existence. Uh, but we cover crops, we cover a very broad range of crops and cereals, um, and fruit and other vegetables, uh, both from a greenhouse gas emissions and removals perspective for sequestration. We also cover off uh, metrics around water efficiency and food loss and waste. And we also have a new perennials pathway coming through in the next few months, which will then do um, sort of apples and citrus and, and the like. We also then cover off livestock with beef and dairy being our primary um, use case for, for livestock, which focuses on GHG, but also includes the emissions um, and potentially sequestration associated with feed and also enteric emissions associated with those. And we also have a biodiversity pathway uh, for measuring whole farm biodiversity metrics um, for a, a number of biomes ar around the world. Um, obviously, the UK is one of those. Now, the Cool Farm tool itself is used in 150 countries, so we're a global tool, um, uh, which is also used for supporting the global supply chain. In terms of how it's used, um, essentially, it's around uh, initial baselining uh, at the farm level, so uh, farmers can measure and model scenarios for their farm and use that to decide what they might want to be doing next for their farm management plans. And I put context is key here because it is. Um, there's, the farms are different and you don't really want tools making recommendations or guidance or instruction about what you should be doing on your farm from a remote position. So the idea with the Cool Farm tool is it provides you with data and insights that you as farmers can then talk to your agronomist and your ecologist about in terms of how, what to do and how that informs what you're going to do next. Once you've got your data, you can then choose to report it. And the data within the Cool Farm tool isn't accessed by anyone. It's, it's your data, but you can choose to authorise it for sharing with your customers. Um, so they are often asking you for that data for their reporting. So you can initiate the process where you will share or you can share your assessment results with them. You can use it for ongoing monitoring uh, and ultimately then use it to drive down reductions and improvements uh, on your farm from a sort of uh, regenerative sustainable agriculture perspective in line with your priorities for your farm. Um, there's lots of tools out there. So how do you choose? Um, and ultimately, this this is kind of our our checklist that we advise. We're we're why, although we provide a tool, we're actually kind of agnostic because we are also the tool that sits embedded within a number of other tools. So we act as the calculation engine for many of the other tools that are out there. So what we talk about is you know when choosing a tool and deciding what you're going to work with is the science and methodology that's backing up that tool, is it both transparent and from a credible source? Do they have appropriate governance procedures in place uh, to ensure the right sort of uh, interpretation of that science is coming through into the tool? Is the tool free for farmers? Because farmers have been put on for many, many years by the supply chain in the industry. And actually this isn't and shouldn't be an area of additional cost for farmers. Who owns the calculator? Um, is becomes important, particularly what are their motives? Are they after your data? Are they sort of seeking to make money out of you in, in other ways? Um, so you should do some digging and, and inquire into that. Um, again, I've touched on who, ha who has access to that data. But ultimately it comes down to which interface do you like? What do you, which tool do you get on with? And what becomes important is don't flip between tools, stay consistent, whichever tool you end up choosing Stick with it and use the same tool over time and deliver reductions using the same tool. I'm sure we'll probably talk about this later, but every tool will give you a different set of results. That's, uh, that's the, you know, there's reasons for it. It's not necessarily a problem. Uh, just stick with the same tool and, uh, and deliver progress and improvements over time. And that's it for me. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard. Um, can I now pass over to Liz, Farm Carbon Calculator, please?
Thank you, Holly. And it's lovely to be here and to tell, tell you something about the Farm Carbon Calculator. So the Farm Carbon Calculator is um, owned by the Farm Carbon Toolkit. And the Farm Carbon Toolkit is an organisation that was set up by farmers for farmers. We're a community interest company and we very much exist to help farmers to understand their greenhouse gas emissions, how to reduce them and how to build carbon into soils and into non-crop biomass. Um, so that's who we are. And alongside our calculator, we've also got a team of advisors and the two very much go together. Our advisors go down farm tracks talk to farmers, support farmers every day with how to reduce their emissions and how to build carbon. And actually they're the best um, critics of our farm carbon calculator because they're using it all the time. Our calculator works across the whole farm. So not only is it collecting data on the emissions from all the inputs that you use on farm, as well as emissions in terms of livestock and farming practice, but we also collect information on soil carbon storage and on trees and hedges on farm that helps to give you as the farmer some information on the level of carbon sequestration going on. We've been doing this now for 15 years. We have got thousands of regular users who use the calculator voluntarily you can see they're up in the top of the screen they're all over the country and indeed we've actually now got users on four continents typically those users overseas are being asked to use our calculator by their customers who want to have all their suppliers information on the same calculator which is a great way forward because most of those businesses are supplying uk retail our calculator's just been independently reviewed by the Carbon Trust, and I couldn't agree more with the comments that Richard Profits just said in terms of, as a user of a calculator, you want to understand that all the methodology is clear and transparent, and all of ours is on our website. And you also, once you put your data into one calculator, certainly or certainly with ours, you can see it there and you can build on it year on year. And once you find a calculator that you like to use, I think all our recommendations would be that you stick with it. So, and alongside um, our calculator, as I've mentioned, we've got an advisory service, but we also so get involved with education and research activities. We've just um, produced the curriculum for the basis model on greenhouse gas accounting. And we also run the Soil Farmer of the Year competition, which has been going since 2005 and this year we started the farm carbon the carbon farmer of the year and we had our first winners on walk yesterday in Scotland so very quickly just to show you what it looks like and we talk about how farmers build up their donuts as you put your information into the calculator you can see your donuts starting to build for all the different sectors that we're asking you to put your data in for and just to say that your farm carbon report is yours. It, it belongs to you, and but you can ask to share your report with other people that you want to share it with. And we've also just developed an API and are starting to develop interoperability with other data platforms, which in time will mean that as a farmer, you can opt to pull your data from other platforms to save you having to put the same data in more than once. And this is what your summary report looks like. So once you put in all your data, you summed it up, the, the box, sorry, the column on the left is your total emissions. The column in the middle in green, in this case is the total carbon sequestration and the column on the right in black is the overall balance. And what it's starting to do is to help you as a farmer to understand what, what you can do to get towards net zero, because within our calculator, there's also a scenario planning option. Now, the final slide from this benchmarking, and I think all of us, I mean, I'm also a farmer too, we're on a journey to understand just what good looks like. And through the data we hold on our calculator, we're starting to build that information on what good looks like. 
So here you can see um, the kind of normal distribution curve for emissions per ton for dairy and for grazing livestock. Now, increasingly, as a farmer, you can see where your business sits within that overall continuum. That's just literally an introduction to the calculator. And I really look forward to the questions that are coming later on. And that's, yeah, for farmers, it's completely free to use our calculator. And you can probably get on within five minutes and start doing your baseline footprint. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Liz. I'll now hand over to Emily from Sandy. Um, Emily, do you want me to? Yeah, I think you've got my slides to Ren. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so Sandy is um, the Smart Natural Capital Navigator by Trinity AgTech, and we refer to it as a Smart Natural Capital Navigator because it really represents um, all of the different farm enterprises, so not just things like arable and horticulture dairy, all the different livestock ones, but also looks at things like anaerobic digestion, as well as soilless controlled environments, so glass houses and things like that. It doesn't just look at these enterprises through a carbon lens, but it also allows you as a farmer to look at it through the lens of biodiversity, water protection and soil erosion alongside that carbon lens. Because as we all know, many of the mitigation practices that you might apply on your farm will impact not only on carbon, but will have an impact on, on improving your biodiversity score, for example, and enhancing your water protection score as well. Our latest release within Sandy, and we've actually got a, a webinar on it tomorrow as part of Countryside COP, is our Natural Capital Valuation module. And this latest module we have built in collaboration with our Trinity Natural Capital Pro Council, of which race are a member. So we're really pleased to bring this to users so that you can not only look at your farm from an environmental standpoint, but you can now put a financial figure on that environmental performance of your farm. So that allows you to have conversations uh, on a level playing field with lenders or other you know, finance options, and it puts that financial figure against it, which is a figure that everybody understands. So Sandy is grounded in world-class science, and we have a science board of over 40 scientists who are all independent and experts in their own fields. They're based at independent organizations, a range of academic organizations and institutes. And our sustainability team within Trinity work with them and our engineers to integrate the latest science and evidence into the platform. What this allows us to do is then to align with also the latest and, and highest standards for carbon footprinting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides time. We're a proudly British firm, but we support over 100,000 farmers in the UK, across Europe, Latin America, We've just recently opened our California office and in the new year, we'll be starting projects both in Japan and Australasia as well. Can I have the next slide, please, Holly? Mm -hmm. So farmers are at the heart of Sandy um, and your data is your data and it belongs to you. Again, there are permissions um, that you can grant to share that data with, with specific people if you wish. In terms of getting your data into Sandy, there's three different onboarding methods. So we have APIs to Gatekeeper and Muddy Boots to make that really seamless for you. But you can also use our Excel templates to upload your data or direct data in entry onto the platform itself. We've designed Sandy so that it fully represents your farm and doesn't miss off any of the farming practices that you're implementing. So whether that's something like rotational grazing or fertilizer technologies that you're using. We want to make sure we ask you for the data that is needed to fully represent your farm. But we don't want to overload you with that data requirement. So we've broken that down into what we call required data. And then there are a number of additional data points as well. If you want a, a full list of those data requirements and, and to go into that in more detail, you can drop me an email and, and we can talk about that. But from an arable enterprise, we take into account everything from cultivation, seeding, cropping, applications of fertilizer, as I say, any fertilizer technologies, crop protection products, use of manures, et cetera. And all of those different data requirements reflect the, the enterprise that you're looking at. 
Next slide, please. So being able to learn from others is really important and we have a dedicated knowledge exchange support within Trinity as well. But something that um, we're really passionate about is also allowing you as a farmer to be able to understand not just what other people are doing, and you can do that through, through our central reporting function, again, with, with the correct and appropriate permissions. But from a benchmarking perspective, being able to compare yourself to your potential. So using the, the data that you've provided, we know where your farm is, we know what is what is your farm's potential, and being able to compare your, your own performance to that potential, but also to be able to give you some ideas of options that you might want to look at from a mitigation perspective to increase <clears throat> that potential on your farm. So next slide, please, Holly. So why Sandy? Um, I've covered a couple of these points, um, but I think they really it really comes around kind of five key areas. So these five key areas are what we call standards-based nature measurement. And you can see the standards there on the right-hand side of the slide, that we're the only tool to align to all of those following standards simultaneously. So we describe that as a super standard. Capital accounting, and I've mentioned the, the natural capital valuation, the new module there, so being able to put that numerical um, financial figure on it. Trans tra transparency, sorry, and traceability. Um, that comes into things when we think about like SBTI flags. So for the supply chain, that's really important that they can um, follow that journey, that, that net zero, that carbon management journey throughout their supply chain. The legal architecture is really important, especially when you're exploring um, opportunities off the back of some of your results from, from a carbon biodiversity, um, et cetera, perspective. Um, and you can see some of the, the nine founding members there at the bottom of the slide of the Pro Council, and they're, they're really integral to ensuring that that framework that we have created through, through Sandy, but also um, you know, Trinity's wider work, um, adheres to that legal architecture and, and the standards themselves help with that as well. And then looking at it from a nature risk perspective as well. So being able to look holistically at your farm and then to be able to say in the future, what are my opportunities? What are my risks here associated with, with, with that natural capital? So as I've said, we cover all farm types and sizes and we're accessible to all. So um, obviously the, the, the concept of cost has come up here. We are a license based software, which means it's an annual subscription based on a number of different factors. But for an average UK arable farm, the cost per ton is around from anywhere, you know, depending on obviously your acreage and, and your um, your yields, anywhere from a pound to two pounds a ton. That's the, the, the cost of your Sandy license. The value that you then get back, the, the information that you get back from Sandy that you can then leverage, the, the value that you get back from that will far outweigh the cost of your Sandy license. We cover all enterprises, as I've said already. We model the emissions and the sequestration. And this sequestration one is really important because we need to make sure that for farmers and for the supply chain, we are modeling sequestration, not just from land use, but from land management practices. So if you're using cover crops, if you are implementing reduced tillage, that we're calculating the sequestration from those land management practices, and not just from if you take arable land out of production and plant it into trees, for example. It's also really important if you're using novel technologies that we can account for that, such as fertilizer inhibitors, um, and, and different application technologies. So, so we take those into account. From an organic perspective, it's really important as well that we can model the rotation and we can look not just at the farm, um, but also the crop and the field level, because it, with everything that we're talking about, we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing in the right place to achieve net zero. Thanks very much, Holly. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Aaron, who works in our soils and natural resources team, who's going to who has got some questions for the panel, and then we will open it up to the floor for general questions. If that's OK. Hi. Thanks, Holly. Um, yes. Yeah, so through various projects that we um, run as part of Innovation for Agriculture, I have had the privilege to test all four of the tools presented today. Uh, and me and fellow users commonly find that each tool calculates a different overall result for the same farm. Could the panelists please explain why this is the case and how this can be navigated by farmers, growers and managers? And I'll direct that first of all to Liz, please. 
Uh, sorry, Liz, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, I'll, I'll unmute myself. I was busy answering some of the questions and I realized I was tapping away. That's so, yeah. Okay. And I, well, it is difficult and I appreciate this kind of frustration it is currently causing farmers. But I think what, what, what's happening is that each of the calculators is seeking to answer slightly different questions. And that's why sometimes the numbers or the, the results come out, come out differently. And I mean, certainly, and, and sometimes we are using slightly different assumptions because at the moment there is no one agreed way of doing it. And each of the calculators has evolved slightly differently um, with different baseline assumptions in terms of what we're trying to find out for farmers. Having said all of that though, all of the calculators, we are starting to work much more closely together now and to align where we can those assumptions and methodologies. And we are all governed by the IPCC requirements and increasingly now aligning with things like the flag guidance um, and SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative. So, and certainly I see it more and more that the results coming out of all the calculators are becoming more aligned. I mean, certainly within our calculator, we provide information on sequestration, which is not done in the same way by the other calculators, but it's fairly clear, it's very clearly set out. So farmers can see where the information is on sequestration and where the information is on emissions. So that, that's my answer to it. But I, I do understand the, the sort of the frustration. And at the moment, a lot of us are working with Dairy UK to harmonize calculators for the dairy sector. And we've, most of us have also been involved in some work which DEFRA commissioned ADAS to carry out. And in fact, we're all joining a call tomorrow where the findings from that ADAS work will be shared with us. So it, it feels to me that, you know, things are moving forward. And I appreciate there was a question in the, the Q&A about the fact that, you know, some of these calculators, we, we are all um, changing because this sector is receiving such massive attention because it's massively important to be able to accurately uh, measure greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So uh, and it will carry on changing rapidly. And there's really no way, way to avoid that because the science is evolving rapidly. But certainly, I think all of us, certainly I speak for the farm carbon calculator, where we change our assumptions, the farmers who've already used our calculator in the past, they can update their reports to the new way of calculating it. So it doesn't mean they're comparing apples with pears. They'll be able to compare last year's performance with this year's on the same basis. Richard, I can see you uh, nodding along. Do you have anything uh, to add to that question? No, I think Liz, Liz nailed all, all the points I would have made against that as well. I think, you know, the tool that, you know, the, the other thing I, I would say is, look, all, all tools are wrong. There is there is no right carbon number, you know, because hidden behind in the science and the methodologies, there are uncertainties in all of the emission factors and, and um, the various factors that go into the calculations. There's uncertainties and there's standard deviation errors in, in there. Mm. So, you know, and anyone who says this is your carbon number, you should walk away from because it's not. It's it's actually a range. They just represent it as a single number. Um, so, so uh, you know, Liz talked about this. It, ultimately, it's a tool to help inform what you're going to do and, and the modelling and the numbers um, kind of identify what your hotspots are and help you decide where to, where to focus. Um, and that's the important thing to walk away with this from. Not that your number's 2% higher than my number, it's different, so I don't trust any tools. That's not the point. It's what's the hotspots, where you, where can you create change on your farm? And that's what you should be taking away from any of the tools. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Um, by the way, if, uh, if you have something to add, because uh, I won't go through each of the panellists on each question, uh, if you have something to add, please raise a hand uh, and I can, I can see if you're urging to answer. Um, now going to the second question, calculating carbon footprint on my farm takes me time and effort. In the long term, how will this financially benefit me? And do these calculations fit in with the supply chain requirements? And I'll send that question directly to Emily. Thanks, Aaron. 
Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, the first half of the question being the, the financial side of things, so I, I mentioned finances a couple of times in, in my introduction, um, but just taking a step back from that, thinking about mitigation options that you might want to apply on your farm, such as, um, you know, alternative fertilisers or, or different cropping or rotation or, um, you know, different tillage, for example, there's been quite a strong body of evidence for a number of years now that has shown these measures that will make you more efficient from a carbon perspective will also make you more financially efficient and resilient as well. So the two go hand in hand. It's not to say that there would be this perfect linear response to any of these mitigation options, but in the long run, um, there's, there's this pattern in the data in terms of reducing your carbon footprint, being more efficient, therefore it's cost savings associated with that. In terms of leveraging the results from your either your carbon or you know from the sandy perspective your your natural capital um, accounts, there's a number of different ways in which you can do that. The one that everybody tends to jump to, but we remain fairly neutral on, um, is is looking at the voluntary carbon market. Um, it's a fairly new market, so there's there's been lots of movers and shakers in this space in the last few years. Um, and there's been lots of mistakes made. Um, so it's again, it's looking at the integrity of that footprint, the legal framework that supports that that carbon trade, if that's something that you want to look at. Um, and then I mentioned in terms of the, um, the, the natural capital valuation, from our perspective, we want to provide farmers with the information so that they can go and have these informed decisions, uh, sorry, informed discussions, and then come up with these informed um, decisions. So that could be proving to, uh, to your bank manager, to, to the person that's lending you money, to invest in you, that you have a sustainable business that can continue to support your crop production in the future. So you haven't got any risks around pollination services or pollination provision you haven't got any risks around soil erosion for example so being able to have you know that set of natural capital accounts in the same way that you'd have a set of financial accounts if you were if you were going and asking for say green finance is being able to have that set of natural capital accounts as well the supply chain um are, are moving in this space as well and i think that's where i come back to the standards so they are lo lots of large organizations um have to align against certain standards for, for much of their supply chain. So that's where the ISO standards are really important because if you're using a tool that is ISO um, aligned, then it fits into to their supply chain model and also the SBTI flag guidance as well. That's where that's becoming really important. So again, it's, it's looking at um, what the requirements are, both of your supply chain, but also of your farm. So which tool best represents your farm um, and, and then the supply chain that you're operating within. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much, Emily. Um, does anyone else ha have anything to add to that question? Julian? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. What we find is that um, this carbon is another form of look at accounting, looking at your business. And you know, every farm I've been on, the farmers, once they understand the, uh, you know, the drivers of the carbon emissions, then they, they come up with things that we have, you know, they come up with new things themselves. You know, it's very much a case of the tools supporting the farmers to to find solutions, and to be you know efficiency is part of it. You know, the supply chains are are really what support the farmers generally speaking, um, and it's the farmers that are going to have to make the changes. So the tools really have to be there to support the farmers, and of course, you know, the farmers have got their own sort of future direction of things to, to think about. So they've really got to understand their position and, you know, look at themselves independently from other actors. And yeah, we, we encourage, you know, understand your carbon footprint and, you know, use that data to improve your business. And Liz, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Yes, what I was going to add to this conversation is that what we find at the Farm Carbon Toolkit is very often reducing greenhouse gas emissions on farms makes really good business sense because, you know, literally we're talking about um, reducing reliance on expensive inputs such as fertilizer, feed and fuels 
and at the same time making the farm more resilient and improving soil health and all of those things you know will generally support the bottom line although you know it I, I'm not saying that very often if you're reducing reliance on some artificial input such as fertilizer that 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 could well have an impact on crop yield but what we're finding is that more and more where farmers are improving soil health that impact on yield is less than would have been the case where soil health was poorer so very much when we're talking to farmers we're looking for that sort of sweet spot where they can both reduce emissions and and at least maintain the bottom line okay, thank you at the end of the year it might pay for itself then um, the last question is uh, what are the future requirements and developments of carbon assessments and will they change with time? And I'll direct that to Richard. Thank you very much. Um, I think I think there's, there's, there is currently increasing collaboration amongst the leading tools. Yeah. So I think we'll see sort of... Um, not not necessarily sort of merging the tools, but certainly greater alignment between the tools um, moving forward. Um, you know, there's there's lots of tools out there. There's been a huge amount of new entries into the into the market recently. You're sort of backed by venture capitalists to seeing a fast buck to be made out of farmers. Um, with any luck, they all fade away because I don't believe they've got farmers' interests in heart. Um, but um, more. more as, you know other aspects to be considering. I think the attention will will continue with carbon, but expand beyond carbon. So I think we'll see, you know, uh, water becoming a topic again. Water sort of goes cyclical; it becomes it comes in and out of fashion. But I think it's going to come back, and biodiversity is almost certainly uh, going to come uh, uh, more important in people's sort of uh, requests and requirements that they're asking for for farmers. Um, the other thing I think that we will probably see is I think we'll start to see the emergence of centralized registries. So, um, you know, most of us have got API interoperability and, and the expectation within the industry is that the data will start feeding through to central repositories. So ultimately then what that means is it doesn't matter what tool you use, it will still end up in a, in, a, in a central repository and therefore the people calling off the data uh, with the farmer's permission can then access it from the central repository. And that will be particularly useful for compliance reporting and also if you've got international supply chains that you're supplying, because um, you know a lot of the tools are country specific. Um, and what you don't really want is a different retailer asking you to use a different tool and you end up using four or five different tools. It's much easier to use whichever tool you're using, feed it into a registry and then the retailers can call it off if they need to. Um, and I think that will be a market evolution um, that is probably literally, well, in, in the next few years. The biggest challenge of that is going to be the whole data ethics piece that goes with it. Fantastic. And uh, going over to you, Julian. So, yeah, what we're finding, you know, farmers actually are increasingly wanting to take more control over this rather than being sort of supported just by a retailer and to decide what happens to the data. Um, and also, we're, we're seeing more people using carbon accounting alongside their budgeting process and saying, right, OK, what's what's our plan for the year ahead? Where are we today? What are we expect to achieve this year? And then reviewing that as they go. And you know, some things work, some things don't work. And so it's just getting built into the fabric of farm management. And, you know, so that really is, you know, for the farmers to, to, to make the most of that to make it a useful you know, every everyday function that they can benefit from. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with Julian there. Increasingly, we're seeing the sort of farm carbon reporting or looking at greenhouse gas emissions coming more into the everyday decision making rather than it being simply an annual thing. So, for instance, you know, if, if you're managing a dairy herd, understanding the different emissions profiles of different inputs might, might well be affecting your decisions in the future. I mean, certainly choosing where what type of fertilizers to buy and where it should come from 
because uh, I mean, I find this really fascinating that if you choose a fertilizer that's come from some parts of the world, its emissions factors are much higher than different products. And what we're already seeing starting to happen is that businesses aren't just looking through, I mean, businesses used to look through our yield lens. Then we brought into play a sort of a natural capital lens and a biodiversity lens, nature-based, nature-friendly farming lens. And now farmers have got another lens to look at, which is their greenhouse gas emissions. And it, it, it's making it more complicated for them, but it's also, you know, meaning that they can find the compromise between all of those different lenses to help them be in the best place possible. Brilliant, thank you so much. I think, oh, Gillian, you got something to add? Sorry, you're muted. Just a quick thing to add that, um, yeah, that forward looking uh, aspect of, of the tools and also the timing, you know, taking decisions because farmers have, have got choices through the years to what to do. And so the tools increasingly becoming more active, uh, something that you can refer to and give you some help with decision making um, because obviously the climate, a lot, of, a lot of things are going on very quickly. So I think that, that will be increasingly valuable so farmers can react. Thank you. I think we have plenty of questions coming from the floor, so I will send it over back over to Holly to uh, go through some of those. Is that OK? Yes, that is fine. I'm just trying to sort out which ones have been answered and which ones haven't. Uh, so we have one here for AgriCalc. Can the tool be used for vineyards and olive production? Oh, not, the same for cool farm tool. Sorry, the same one has come up for cool farm tool. Um, not at the in the current version. Our new AgriCalc cloud does have uh, those in it, so that's coming shortly. Okay. Um, for the cool farm tool, our new perennials module is focused on citrus, apples, <clears throat> uh, cocoa, and coffee at the moment. Um, but we are expanding the typologies that will be coming in it. So it really depends on where the demand sits uh, as to which type of will come through next. Right. Oh, as well as feed and enteric fermentation, this should also include the subsequent animal products, processed dairy and meat. I don't know if that's relating to Something I like can uh, let me jump onto that. So it depends on the scope of the tools. So Emily mentioned flag guidance. So the flag mm -hmm. guidance talks about the farm level gate, to, you know, uh, field to gate effectively of the farm. Some of those processes will be off farm and further down the supply chain. So yes, they're part of scope three emissions reporting, but they may not be within the scope of the actual calculation tools that we're talking about today. Um, what is the scale of difference between the carbon tools? Hmm. <laughs> Who's going to take that? I'll Liz. take it first well. if you like. I, I mean, I think I think probably um, we'll find out tomorrow. Well, in fact, we've already found out because the work that ADAS has done for DEFRA has. So what they did was ADAS developed. I think it was either. Oh God, I'm going to get this wrong. Thirty farm models for the the main agriculture sectors and they subjected those farm models to each of I think it is five calculators um, of which three are here, here this evening I think and so that they they have then assessed the difference in scale of results and it, it, it varied depending on the farm type and depending on the calculator so I don't think you can give one answer um, and it also de depended on the kind of um, things that are on the farm, because different calculators, for instance, might assume a low level of rainforest deforestation for soya bean meal. Others might, might assume a higher level of deforestation, and that has a significant impact on the final number that, that is in the report. So it's, and it's very often things like that that will affect the actual report number. So just to add to that, a key bit difference is the databases, which uh, Liz touched on for, say, feeds, 
fertilizer sources and other inputs. And there is work, obviously, GFLIs coming through to help on the feeds. Uh, mm -hmm. Fertilizers are still much less and much more variable. But th these initiatives need to gather pace to help the calculators as well. Great. Um, so what is the advantage to farmers of having competing tools? Would there be any merit? Oh, I think that's meant to say, would there be any merit in combining resources, i.e. All, all joining forces, I guess that means, which I know you've kind of covered, but is anyone, anyone expand on that? I, I'm, happy, I'm happy to, to say, uh, yeah, there's, there's not a huge amount of value in competition, which is why I, I, I think it's really interesting that there's a lot of private money coming into a market where there's already credible tools. Um, there is also a fair bit of um, collaboration that is going on behind the scenes. Um, between a number of the tools. So yeah, I think they are coming together and, you know, co-developing methodologies and approaches um, to take this forward. I think just to add to that, yeah, that, that interoperability is going to be key. You know, no one tool is probably going to suit all the different sectors and different. No, and, and, and I'd add to that, that I think Certainly, a number of the tools will be looking to see how we can actually sort of work together in this space because, I mean, Richard's absolutely right. We were set up to support farmers um, and it, there's no value in competing just for the sake of it. It's about actually providing the best tools. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um... What tier figures are these calculators using, especially with livestock? What was the vital word? What, oh, what sorry. Figures? What tier? What tier? What tier figures? Ah, uh, what tier figures? Oh, golly. Tier two. From a Sandy perspective, tier two and tier three, um, and I think with the with the data requirements, when you're looking at at the carbon calculators, the so. so the the tiering of data describes the um i guess the the relatedness to your to your farm so tier one is very generic it doesn't relate specifically to your farm tier two and tier three obviously then takes it through to to more related to your farm and the use of modeling as well so tier three includes modeling and i think the the thing with and that's part of the the ipcc standards thing with the standards is they kind of the the base level that's that's what um all tools should be adhering to and then it's looking at okay and how else does this tool represent my farm so there could be there could be some data that that um represents your farm and you want to check that that is being included so like rotational grazing is is a really good example of one can the tool account for rotational grazing um and, and making sure that that reflects your farming system um so yeah the, the data piece is really important how do these fall carbon footprinting tools interact with organizations, platforms who are modeling product life cycle assessments for foods, e.g. the companies, Food Steps and B0. Is there any collaboration there? Um, okay, I'll make a start on that. So the, the, there's a UK inventory and the numbers in those UK, in that UK inventory, inventory are to some degree based on LCAs and where essentially what all the calculators have to do is find where there is a, an agreed UK inventory number. I think we, we use that. Otherwise, we have to find the most reliable research to inform the, the numbers we put with, on our calculators. And there's another question in the chat about that. And certainly we, we do spend a lot of time looking at research to make sure we've got the most accurate emissions factors or most accurate data included in our calculator, but it has to be robust and it has to be reliable. And sometimes the amount of research that's being done or the, or the information simply isn't good enough to be able to put onto our calculators. Um. I think, sorry, one thing to say is that um, the, 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 the farm industry is actually increasingly keen that the, whether it's the supply chains or the governments actually understand what's happening on farm and what is achievable. <laughs> um, 
and there's I think there's a lot of pressure to, to cut re reduce emissions um, and there's been quite optimistic sort of adding of different measures together to yeah farms can do this farms can do that but the farms have got to put back the other way what is actually achievable on the ground uh, what is the what is the real situation and that's really valuable for the farmers because that that helps just keep <laughs> other parts of the supply chain of governments uh, connected to the reality. All right. Um, so, but, sorry, just, just sorry, Holly, sorry, just to okay. move on. You know, another aspect of this is coming down the road is the new land sector removals guidance that's coming out from um, the uh, GHG protocol mm -hmm. is, is talking about, and it's in draft consultation, we're still waiting on the final issue, um, yeah. but it's talking about when modelling removal so soil sequestration you the models have to be a tier three model okay so that's essentially a process-based model reflecting as, as emily says exactly what's happening on on the farm now the reality of that is that all of our models to comply with that are going to have to get more complicated uh, because the data points needed for a process-based model are significantly more than most of our models are using at the moment because most of our models are sort of essentially based on an empirical based approach so so the expectation is that all the models will be getting more complicated in order to model the sequestration as it comes down now the the the, the knack behind that then is going to be well, what what can we use as proxy data versus what has to be farm data and how do we keep it as simple as possible for farmers uh, but uh, you know it, it, it is coming unless unless uh GHG protocol pull, pull pull the rug from what they've already been talking about and decide to backtrack. Um, but the expectation is that um, um, some of these models will be getting more complicated in order to make it tier three for sequestration. Um, mm -hmm. But but that becomes important because a lot of the LCA work draws from national inventories, and one of the challenges with that is. Actually, the retailers or the food producers want their emissions and their LCA because they want the programs they're putting in with their farms to be reflected in their products. And so there's going to be an increasing requirement for product level. So not whole farm, because they're, yeah. they're not interested in the whole farm. They're interested in the wheat that comes off my suppliers, you know, not necessarily the whole farm. So, so there is a requirement for products level footprinting coming out from the farms to feed into these LCAs rather than just using a standard UK wheat factor. Um, so, so we can probably expect more increasing demand for that. Um, Holly, I was just going to add um, with that, the greenhouse gas protocol land sector and removals guidance um, that, that Richard's mentioned. That's where looking at all the other standards alongside it are really helpful for people. So as, as, um, as mentioned earlier, being ISO 14067 um, aligned, that gives good alignment to that. So that means that, you know, that, that modelling that, that Richard's just described, where, you know, some of us are already pretty close to that to achieve that, that next alignment to those standards. So I think, I think that, going, again, going back to that question about why we get different results, that's another really clear reason why is because of the, the difference in the standards and the alignment to them. Um, but these standards are only going to go and get um, yeah more and more demanding. So yeah, worth bringing that in mind. Great, thank you, um, Liz. Sorry, was your hand up from earlier? Yes. No, sorry. So we've now. only got a few more minutes left. So I will. The panelists have kindly said they don't mind running a few minutes over. But if anyone does have any more questions, if you put them in the chat now, we will. If, even if it's not in this live session, we will make sure they do get answered. But I've just got a few more questions just to wrap it up. Oh, okay. So. Is it possible for each enterprise to have a sing single index to track progress towards net zero, combining data from all the tools? Do you think that's something that is coming or anyone? I'm, I'm not sure how helpful that would be. Um, a single index, I think probably what's more important is to understand what your index would be to track progress anyway i mean presumably they're thinking about emissions per ton or emissions per hectare for different enterprises um then i think to have a number which is an amalgamation of all the calculators i'm not sure that would be of any benefit because i think that the biggest thing that's 
is is the difference between the calculators is the questions they're seeking to answer and what i do think would be helpful is if it was almost a bit clearer uh, as to actually i mean we, we've got our methodology is, is published on on our website and but whether that makes it clear enough to farmers exactly how we're doing it i'm not sure um it's but i don't know that it would be helpful to have a combined um, index from bringing all the, the results from each calculator together i think it might just be more confusing i think that's where yeah. that's the scientific benchmarking comes in so it's saying this is you know within each farm specific to your farm business to the enterprises that you have to your geographical location etc cetera, etc cetera, this is your potential and then using that as the index to track progress so you can say i'm in you know the top 25 percentile or the bottom 25 whatever it is i think that's that's valuable but i'd agree with liz so i'm not sure what the value would be in combining the data from the tools because they're so varied anyway in terms of the standards mm. and the enterprises they include um so yeah i think i think that could be confusing sorry richard yes. you... yeah i think i'll just overlay onto this i agree with everything that's just been said i think the other thing to think about as well is you know our food supply systems international um yeah. to to a large extent as well and so you know whatever devfer are dreaming up the eu are dreaming up as well and the us are dreaming up as well um and they've all got different initiatives for alignment and standardization of metrics and ways of reporting so if you're supplying into any of those other markets they're going to have demands on you and what you're reporting as well so again it's it's almost I wouldn't say necessarily pointless, but the idea of trying to get to a unified index or a unified set of metrics is is pretty far away. Um, I think there are some global initiatives that are trying to do this, but um, you get 200 people in a room, you'll get 400 answers. So, you know, I'm not sure they'll ever align. I think, well, some of the initiatives to actually bring consistency amongst tools Probably the most critical thing is when we talk about the inputs and the different factors within each enterprise, being clear what we actually mean. And because it's that raw input data that in the end can be calculated in different ways. So I think uh, that is going to be a key thing so that you can maybe switch between you know uses or tools or standards. But to get that raw data to, the, to an accepted or understood standard, I think is probably the most important ground level uh, improvement. Great. Um, and I guess we've kind of covered this now, but it, the one, someone said, do you see a world where DEFRA will mandate that all farms need to have a carbon footprint and recommend one calculator for farmers to use? I think we've kind of covered that. And again, if we'd had DEFRA on the call, they could answer that. So I think, I think, I think they probably will mandate carbon. I think we'll find out tomorrow whether they think they're going to get to one tool or not. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Oh, do all the calculators include hedgerows? That's a quick fire, hopefully a quick fire one. Yes. Yeah, thumbs yes. up, thumbs up. Yeah, all include hedgerows, fab. Um, is there a better calculator for different types of farms? I think we, again, I think we've addressed probably that one. Um, do the calculators acknowledge and reward that biological methane from livestock is less damaging than industrial produced methane? It, that's well, that's we're talking about GWP star amongst yeah. other metrics, but yeah, we are agriculture is uh, bringing that in. Yeah. <clears throat> Given that the food system is interconnected, should these tools also calculate the scope free emissions? and water footprints from the purchased products generated by the consumer, as this is what is driven ecosystem collapse. Say that again, again <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Given that the food system is interconnected, should these tools also calculate the scope three emissions and water footprints from the purchased products generated by the consumer, as this is what is driving ecosystem collapse? From the yeah. purchase products generated by the consumer. So th this comes back to the purpose of the tools. So most, I think all of our tools are aimed at the farm level emissions or removals. 
And so what, what's been talked about there is the consumer use phases of the, of the products, which is out of scope for the design of our tools. Um, so ultimately, you know, they're, they're, I know there's some other initiatives to do full, full sort of supply chain reporting and, you know, take the data from our tools for the agricultural part and then put on the, the various milling processing and sort of retail elements, manufacturing retail elements as well to kind of get a, get a whole, <clears throat> a whole supply chain picture. Um, but, but part, part of that question is an interesting one. If we're talking about it's the consumer's choice, well, we're talking about the food and beverage industry here. Yeah. So if they if their consumption ties directly back to the farm production, so if we're talking about them being part of the problem, well, so is the farm. It's a, yeah, um, it's a bit of a yeah, loop thing going on. I'm trying to understand as well as who the consumer is in this question. Is this as in the farmer is the consumer because they're the they've purchased the fertilizer, in which case, um, I mean I can't speak on behalf of the other tools, but we embedded mm. emissions. Um so we do include scope three emissions of purchased products if you consider the farmer as the consumer. But I, I'm not hundred percent clear if that's what they mean by the question. No, I, I'm a bit confused by the question, but certainly. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, so, no, no, don't worry, answer. you can't help it. I mean, certainly, and embedded emissions are something which is starting to be considered more by all the calculators and also by flag, uh, because and it is important because many calculators at the moment, for instance, don't include the embedded emissions from capital investment in buildings or machinery, but there's an awful lot of embedded carbon in such things, metal and concrete, and we probably do need to all of us to include those and things like that. It, it, all of these things that they're all it's all moving along. It, one one critical thing for the farming side of point is that that their scope three emissions are clear in their reporting because national governments are obviously look, are not are looking at the farming's contribution to emissions. So, um, and we include. The uh, embedded emissions, but they need to be split out so that uh, when, in terms of the government's requirements, what the farmers, their share of the inventory is not, uh, it's got to exclude those scope three so that that has to be visible to help see the position of agriculture. Mm. Fab. Okay, right. One final one, and then we'll, I say, any of these other questions that are coming in, we'll make sure that they do get answered at a later date. But so the final one that I'm going to finish on is where do we find out? who is on the science panels that each of the tools have? I was just busy working on that one, Holly. Well, I know that's why it keeps moving up and down as to which ones have been answered and which ones haven't. I just... Um, yeah, so do you all have a... Do you all have a way if we can find out where who's on your panels? Yeah, I, I just popped in the, um, in the chat to that. Um, we have some of them listed on our website, but... Um, uh, that number is always growing as as we you know evolve the tool and bring in new enterprises etc and new science. Um, but it's our our science board is led by Simon Potts, and so there's a number of other names that are available on the website as well. And for the Cool Farm tool, it's all listed on our website. Right. Oh, let's, and sorry. same for Farm Carbon Toolkit. I mean, it it, it it's very open source. Um, yeah. You can contact us about that. That's we haven't actually got it on the website yet, but yeah, just you can get in touch. Amazing. Oh well, thank you so much, everyone. And say, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I think we managed <clears> to answer <throat> most of them. If not, I say we'll we'll make sure that they do get answered um, after the session finishes. But I realise we've gone ten minutes over our allotted time. But th so thank you so much to all our panelists, and thank you for all the attendees. Um, we had over a hundred, I think, dialing in. Um, and this will be uh, this has been recorded, so it will be available, um, I believe, via the COP. Um, I think COP will COP Countryside COP will email it out. And I think it will be also mm -hmm. be on their YouTube, their YouTube channel. Um, so yes, yeah, so no, thank you very much, everyone, and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thank you very much. Good bye. Evening. bye.